This is a liquid helium refrigerator that produces liquid helium for the superconducting magnet. And the magnet control room is actually up these stairs, um, and they have their own special computers in order to, to operate the superconducting magnet. So they're actually a barrel toroid, two end cap toroids, and a central solenoid. The central solenoid was built by Japan, so we have probably the world's most complicated magnetic system. Mm -hmm. And it stores an enormous amount of energy. The, the barrel toroid stores about a gigajoule. So it's a huge magnetic field. Actually, everybody who is allowed to come in the cavern will get their retina scanned. And like the CIA, you have to put your eyeball in this to identify you. And then a few people will be allowed to go in uh, for quick access when the machine is operating. And the machine turns off, um, it will cool down radioactively and larger numbers of people can go in. Right now we're, we're lucky because nothing, no radiation, nothing has happened, so everything is very quiet. But when we start operating, it will become much harder to get in. That's a, a safety sign saying that there is an oxygen deficiency danger. So I've never of, seen such never a thing. Seen a That's a very interesting warning song. For the, uh, I would not have guessed lack of oxygen. So we have uh, liquid nitrogen in the cavern. We have liquid Anyway, this is, uh, we're now in the Atlas Cavern. We'll walk on this catwalk from one end of the cavern to the other. And unfortunately, the grand view is blocked. <laughs> so in order to see how large it is, you have to be a little daring and come to the railing and look down to where the floor is. Make sure your hard hat doesn't fall. And then look up, and you can see way up inside the, uh, the cavern, that's one of the access shafts. So, um, unfortunately, well, if you look straight through here, you can actually see um, to the other wall of the detector. So this particular view is much more grand when the end cap toroid, which is this device here, is moved back onto the beam line. At the moment, it's off to the side in order to install the small wheel, which is uh, one of the devices we actually made, contributed to in the United States. So anyway, what you're seeing now are elements of the muon system. Um, this is the, the big wheel, and I think everybody will have to come and, and look just down the, the, the corner to see it. But it's 25 meters in diameter, and you can look right through here, and you'll see a huge wall of I don't know, hundreds and hundreds of trigger chambers. And then behind that are tracking chambers, and behind the tracking chambers are two more layers of trigger chambers. So one of the things that I didn't mention before is that when the protons collide, they're very nonspecific as to how they interact. They mostly produce what we call base events or low bias events or junk. <laughs> and what we're trying to do is to find the really, really important Higgs particle out of this huge number of uninteresting events. So we have to search maybe one part in a billion, or maybe even smaller, in order to see these rare events. So instead of, to make sure that your computing system and your disk space and so on is not overwhelmed by these uninteresting events, we trigger. So we have to develop a very fast electronic signal that tells you that you have something that's potentially interesting in physics. So for example, in the muon system, 
we can trigger on a muon of momentum of 6 jev or larger, 6 giga electron volts or 20 giga electron volts. And given that, then the, the rate should go way down, and we will then write a subclass of events onto, onto disk so that we will be able to see this tiny little signal somehow. So not only does the muon generate, uh, system generate triggers, but the calorimeter generates triggers and so on. So each one of the subsystems has a, has a very fast um, uh, electronics that uh, looks for interesting signals and then says, ah, this event is interesting, let's write it onto disk, let's analyze it. So one of the things about this collider is that it, it produces it has very, very large numbers. We actually have um, a very large number of interactions every beam crosses. When the accelerator is operating, the beams come in sausage bunches, and so they bang, 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 bang against each other like this, and they produce um, a collision once every 25 nanoseconds. And in every of the, each one of those collisions at 25 nanoseconds, when these things bunches collide with each other, there's something like 10 events produced. So you can imagine the enormously high rate uh, of events that we have. So you have to, out of this huge number of, of events, tremendous flow of particles from the intersection point, we need to, to have fast enough electronics to be able to, smart enough trigger, and good enough software to be able to, to catch the rare event. That's right. That's right. Very high. In fact, the detector is so large that the next event happened before the remains of the previous event has gotten through the detector. <laughs> okay, so everybody come here and have a stare down through here, if you like. If you sort of put your eyeball here, you can see a blue thing roughly in the middle. That's where the beam is. Um, that's going to be a shielding. So the beam comes in from the left and from the right and collides. Over there. Uh, but you can see the size of the big wheel. This object here is the end cap toroid, and it is um, very cold inside. This is the cryostat, so it's basically at room temperature on the outside. But on the inside, there are superconducting coils. They're not superconducting temperature now, but they're quite cold. Um, but all of the uh, super insulation and the vacuum insulation uh, makes it so that there's no frost on the outside. <laughs> It's about uh, 10 meters or so directly in this direction. Um, so you, unfortunately, you can't see it. You have to, in fact, Atlas is quite a maze. You have to climb in and, and uh, can be very disoriented because you go in these little catwalks and you can see vast numbers of catwalks where electronic crates are mounted, uh, uh, lots of cabling is, and so on. And then from those catwalks, you're able to go in special passages so you can actually go inside the detector. The detector is open. Some of the inner parts are on rails which can be open and you sort of climb in. And one of the most awful things which I don't particularly like to do is in order to get to some inner parts you have to crawl through a hole about this big in diameter. And it's all well lit. <laughs> but if you're claustrophobic, forget it. <laughs> you have to go in and Yeah, some of these. So, yeah. they would have been high school chemistry where water. heat it up. take a thermometer and the amount of water and the temperature is these little spaces are just little hexagons. That's right. They're little, they're little hexagons that are made out of plastic, which are insulating. And they're and, filled with liquid argon. And it's in liquid argon, so it's about 80 degrees Kelvin. 80 degrees. That's right. Nice and chilly. Nice and chilly. Kind of a giant refrigerator form. Yeah. So the other parts of the detector are indicated here. This is um, yeah. a little paper. <laughs> um, these are some of the prototypes of the of the silicon devices. Um, it's amazing that right at the, the central tracker, um, 
with this enormously high radiation, their um, silicon devices, so it's basically a computer chip, but by um, biasing the silicon in a particular way, you can actually make it so that it detects ionization. And so um, by using the technology that's used in making silicon chips, you can then produce uh, detectors with enormously high resolution and very, very fine grain. So the ultimate detector is a pixel detector. And in the central tracker, there's a layer of pixels, so we get a, a three-dimensional reconstruction of the track. Um, but it's very expensive technology, and it can only be done on a relatively small scale. You can't make a muon system out of pixels, although that would be absolutely ideal. It would just cost an enormous amount of money. What is an amount of money? <laughs> <laughs> Tell me just how oh, many zeros. Well, how many zeros? Well, I think overall Atlas may cost about a billion dollars. Billion dollars. Okay. That's um, it. So, so I'm money. talking multiple billions of dollars. And it would be technologically very difficult, if not impractical. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, collision of... Uh, <laughs> Anti-matter. I think what lots we do is... Um, yeah, lots of groups. The collaboration. <laughs> All right. Well, this is the um, the Atlas control room, <laughs> and um, it looks like probably any other control room of any other big scientific facility. It's not quite NASA standards, but. Like anyway, <laughs> we have uh, banks of computers, and you can see the signs uh, on each bank, and each sign is related to the particular uh, part of the experiment. So, for example, this is the silicon tracker. That's the liquid argon. Uh, tile calorimeter, the muons over there, the trigger over there. Uh, and then behind these in these desks here are sort of the the main uh, over controllers, the ones who control each one of the subsystems. So it's organized in a way that, as I mentioned, the detector is built, namely each one of the components, the central tracker, the neuron system, generates its own data, and then the data for the event, and the triggers, of course, are coordinated with the central trigger processor. So once the trigger uh, has been indicated as being of interest, then the information is collected. And it's done on a very rapid time scale, because remember the collisions are once every 25 nanoseconds, and there may be 10 of these collisions. The interesting ones are, will be on the order of maybe 100 hertz. Can I just ask who decides which ones are going to be interesting? <laughs> Well, it's Sounds actually like a responsibility, decided, <laughs> or is it just a fact? Um, it's actually done by a whole series of calculations previously. So we know, for example, uh, some of the physics triggers. For example, the Higgs yeah. um, the, uh, has a set of properties. And one of the properties in, in the so-called golden mode, for example, is the Higgs can decay into four muons, um, a <coughs> mu plus, mu minus pair, and another mu plus, mu minus pair. So or four tracks which are penetrating the muon system. So we then say, on the basis of simulation, what the signature of that particular process looks like. And on the basis of that, then you form your electronic thresholds and so on to match that. So you, you're alert. You've already agreed You've already, on the algorithms. That's and right. You're alert. But yeah. actually, you put your finger on something which has a soft, <laughs> subtle spot. Yeah. Because there are some, some aspects, I mean, for example, there could be some processes that some theorists could think of, uh, or some experimentalists, that might be very interesting and very bizarre. And then what you have to do is say, OK, we're going to go and try to generate a trigger for that. And one of the things about the trigger is that you, it's like any communication path. You have a limited bandwidth you have to control. And um, for example, it could be that the muons could make their trigger a very low threshold and hog all of the bandwidth. But that would make the calorimeter guys unhappy and it wouldn't, it wouldn't be the proper physics balance. So there's contention for bandwidth uh, and you have to 
sort of organize your trigger and collaborate with, with everybody to have the grand synthesis to have the best window to see whatever interesting physics you Is this live data that's being shown? This here? is actually a replay, um, okay. but you can get a sense of the detector. This is the detector in cross section, so the beams are coming mm -hmm. left and right. This is the intersection point. And now we're undergoing cosmic ray testing. So here are cosmic rays that we've actually recorded. So these green tracks are muons that are coming from cosmic rays. And, um, and then these yellow hits are, um, are information that's actually been recorded in the, in the calorimeters. So this is a very nice event, <laughs> a typical event. So it's the red are the trigger chambers that triggered on the event. So we're now exercising the system. Um, the cosmic ray came down and interacted in the calorimeter and it went all the way through the intersection point and interacted on the other side. Mm -hmm. And muons are very penetrating, so the ray down below is much smaller than the ray in Denver or the mountaintop, but nevertheless, we use the muons, uh, cosmic rays, to, to debug the system electronically. And now what we're doing is going through a series of what's called milestone runs. And so everybody gets a detector to work, and then we all come in here, and there are 50 people in here, and it's noisy, and then everybody has to get organized. And we run for a week, 24 hours, and try to report cosmic rays. And then you discover, ah, oh, this chamber doesn't work, or this is inefficient, and uh, you exercise the whole system. Mm -hmm.